Well, good morning to all of you. I wanted to give you just a little historical background today and emphasize some of the things that our wonderful speakers have said so far. I thought that I might start, since we're in St. Louis, with looking up who St. Louis was, since many um, places in the world are named for him. There he is, he was Louis the Ninth of France, who ruled in 1214 to 1270, which is during a period that a lot of people presume to call the Dark Ages. Well, during the Dark Ages, he banned trial by ordeal, he introduced the presumption of innocence. He laid the foundation for a great world university. He cared for the poor personally. And he, he was even recognized by the US Supreme Court as an important lawgiver. Now, in today's supposedly enlightened age, we have things like physicians' health programs. We have asset forfeiture before someone is even accused of a crime. We have a greater than 95% conviction rate. Our universities are being turned into propaganda mills. The poor are being turned over to the non-mercies of the welfare state and charity is even being stigmatized. The successors to St. Louis were by no means saintly. Of course, you remember Louis XIV who said, Le taisez moi I am the state who established a centralized absolute monarchy in France. And his successor, Louis XV, reputedly said, après moi, le déluge, after me, the flood, or the deluge, which didn't take very long. In 1789, we had the fruits of the French Enlightenment, which was much more radical than the English Enlightenment. The French Revolution could be compared with the American War of Independence, where we had um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau instead of John Locke. Uh, we had an effort to displace God entirely and replace him with reason. Contrast Robespierre with Washington. The Americans wanted to restore the rights of Englishmen. The French deliberately wanted to destroy the old order. And instead of ordered liberty, they got chaos. They had the slogan, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, with this great emphasis on equality, which means something very different from what it means in the US Declaration of Independence. And after the French Revolution, something even worse happened, which was written about in this book published in 2004 called Critics of the Enlightenment. It's a, it's a collection of works by six Frenchmen that I'd never heard of before. And they had some very interesting essays, very worth reading. They wrote in the 1800s, and it's, it's just chillingly uh, pertinent today. One of them wrote about Buonaparte. He insisted on using the Italian spelling for Napoleon's name, because Napoleon was from Corsica. He was foreign in every aspect of, his, of, of himself. He despised all things that were French. The children, he in, insisted, were to be schooled in irreligion, debauchery, and blind obedience to the sovereign. Paternal authority was treated as being prejudice and abuse. Words well before the days of George Orwell changed their meaning. His regime was full of lies, monumental waste. He destroyed the army, of course got a lot of them frozen to death in Russia. He destroyed the navy. He wrecked all aspects of industry that came to his attention. And that was called fundamental transformation. Which put, puts us in mind of the well-known French aphorism, the more things change, the more they stay the same. A lot of changes have been going on fairly recently to destroy the old order in Europe as during the World Wars. You have probably read three of the novels that were released about the time of the end of World War II. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, 1984 by George Orwell. You may not have read this third one, which was published in 1945, three years before Orwell's 1984, by C.S. Lewis called That Hideous Strength. It will never be assigned in a school. 
Recently, I read an issue of the Atlantic Monthly that had an article called The Coddling of the American Mind, which informed me about this concept of trigger alerts, that you don't dare assign anything for our college students to read without trigger alerts to let them know about things that may make them feel uncomfortable or may offend their sensibilities. Then I read an Amazon.com review that said that uh, that hideous strength would have every trigger alert imaginable. And as soon as I found that out, I went to my bookshelf and dug up my yellowed copy to reread. And it really is quite interesting. It's supposed to be a fantasy, but three quarters of it are a scientific dystopia. It has to do with the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. And we read, uh, heard, heard about a different NICE last night, which is the NHS rationing regime. And the late Dr. Hilton Terrell, who was once our president-elect, thought that perhaps it's not a coincidence that these two aphorisms are the same. The, the goal of the NICE in the novel was to apply science to social problems and back this up by the full force of the state. The protagonist, Mark, wanted to enter the inner circle. He was a sociologist and he wanted to be in on this great new uh, experiment. But he needed a little bit of re-education to try to do away with all of his natural instincts. So they had a place called the objective room where just the proportions were wrong, the corners were not square, the point of the arch was slightly off, they had some bizarre artwork and other things. They also had this concept, they were gonna do away with punishment, criminal punishment, because that was always finite. There was a limit to what you could do to a criminal, but not to what you could do to a patient who needed remedial treatment. One day, Mark had a revelation. Something else, something he vaguely called the normal, apparently existed. He was having his first deeply moral experience. He was choosing a side, the normal. And if the scientific point of view led away from all that, then be damned to the scientific point of view. G.K. Chesterton also warned, as jo Joseph Sobran pointed out, against the modern and morbid habit of always sacrificing the normal to the abnormal. That is liberalism in a nutshell, and it will always find more things to sacrifice on its altar of normality, abnormality. What is a normal anyway? When you say that word, most people think about the Gaussian probability distribution function, and all kinds of things are supposed to be described by this function, including laboratory tests, and it probably does apply to 40% of them, which means that 60% of them have some different type of distribution, but no matter, we make the convenient assumption and we try to say that everything that's between the two standard deviations is normal, and beyond that, we have outliers. Uh, particularly, CMS loves this concept of outliers, say for your Medicare billings, and if you're out there, you're aberrant, you're deviant, and you're probably a fraud, and something has to be done with you. Now, the very existence of this distribution function suggests that there are differences in the world, and that's, just, that's just normal. But these days when we're talking about disparities, every point along that line is supposed to have the proper uh, distribution of, of privileged versus, versus um, disadvantaged groups. So we have to do away with the differences or make sure that we even them out somehow. And we can no longer count on the mean being considered normal. For example, cholesterol. All of you have probably had cholesterol that's too high, even if it's right at the normal, and you need to take statin drugs, and never mind what that does to your central nervous system. Then we all, even worse, we have the, the inversion of the concept of normality, that it may be that 95% of the people have certain instincts or a certain way, but if you do not say that the 5% that don't see it that way are perfectly normal, then you are probably afflicted with a mental disease or perhaps even guilty of a crime that ends in phobia or ism. 
But you know, this is, this is a mathematical thing. There is another meaning for normal. In fact, the original meaning for normal is a line that's normal is perpendicular to another line. And it's described by these old-fashioned terms like straight, square, right angle, true. The, the, the very word normal is derived from norma, and this is a norma. It is specifically my father's battered carpenter square next to a wall that he built at my house. And carpenters have used these for millennia. St. Joseph is often depicted carrying a norma. And in this, this painting done about the times of Charles Dickens, you might be able to see a right triangle on the wall with his tools. And it's sort of ridiculous in this concept to say that your norma is true for you and my norma is true for me. This wouldn't work in the construction industry. And in fact, it's possible to check on whether or not things are true. At, uh, my father always uh, d did this by measuring the diagonal in a building that he was laying out. Before the days of electronic calculators, I was the family square root calculator. So I calculated his diagonals. I didn't really understand why I was doing that. It never occurred to my dad to explain things that were perfectly obvious. It was obvious to him, um, but you know, 50, more than 50 years later, I'm still trying to understand a lot of the things I took, that he taught me. It is true, I'm a recovering geometry teacher, that the con converse of the Pythagorean theorem is also true, that if you have a triangle and a, plus, plus a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you know you have a 90 degree angle. And the ancients knew how to use this. The Egyptians would take a rope and tie knots, at 12 knots at equ equidistant, and then they'd make a three, four, five triangle, and then they would know that they had a square corner. And you really need to do this. It has something to do with why Joshua's walls and I kind of kind of tumbling down. When Jeremy and I were visiting the Robinsons in Oregon, Joshua was building a little addition to their cabin. He had framed a wall that was on the ground and while we were waiting for lunch, the big boys went outside and stood the wall up. So I said, Joshua, are you sure it's not gonna fall down? And he said, of course, Jane, I made sure that it was straight. And then I bolted it to the foundation. Now we know foundations are important. Here is an abnormal building. You have heard of settled science. This is a settled building. It was built on clay. And it is going to come tumbling down. This is one reason why it hasn't done so yet. It's at 800 tons of lead counterweights on one side of it. But so much for the construction industry, what, what about the society? What about the law? This is a television, American television miniseries about the Nuremberg trials. And I wrote something about that in the August 2014 issue of AAPS News, and there's one of those in your packets. The American judge who presided over the proceedings was a Supreme Court Justice, Robert Jackson. And he did a lot of reflecting on how to do this, what is really going on here? Because he said, you know, there's, there's got kind of a problem. We're going to be proposing to execute people who were following the law of the land. They were abiding by the law. In fact, there may have been even requirements of the law to do what they did. I mean, the Germans had a point. You won, we lost, so shoot us already. And the Soviets thought that was a pretty good idea. But the American judge thought that we ought to establish some sort of principle for the rule of law. So he went looking around for a venue for the trial. And this was in the, the this is courtroom 600 in the uh, Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. And according to the movie, he found a, a plaque displaying the Ten Commandments in this building. And he decided this is where we will hold the trial. Well, here is a, a Nuremberg woodcut from 1524 showing that Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. This is not what they, they, the plaque that was in the building. This was in a museum. And I don't know whether what the, what the um, movie said was true. How could the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses, 
be posted in the very courtroom where Jews were being stripped of their rights. Imagine the irony. I mean, it's not um, nearly as bad as that, but think of the Ten Commandments being posted in American public buildings, especially the part about thou shalt not steal. And we know what Hitler said about the Ten Commandments. He thought they were not valid. He said, conscience is a Jewish invention. It's a blemish, like circumcision. And the heaviest blow ever struck humanity was Christianity. And our national socialist movement is going to create mankind anew. Just like in 1984, Brave New World, and that hideous strength. A which form of government provides the best happiness, the greatest happiness? Well, we can't really measure the diagonal, but we can look at the, maybe the concept that by their fruits you will know them, that maybe there will be fewer abandoned children, crimes and lawsuits. We can look at the prison population. We can look for more good faith in commerce. We can look for integrity in the administration of justice. And I think you might agree that by these criteria, the United States these days is not doing all that well. The French reactionaries wanted to restore the throne of St. Louis. I'm not sure any of us would think that that was a good idea, but we ought to look to what were our own foundations. Well, of course, here is the US Constitution. That truly is the law of the land. Not something passed by Congress, not something made up by the US Supreme Court. That is the law of the land. And you will notice that it is written in cursive. And if Common Core educators have their way, future generations will not be able to read it. So they won't be able to, to compare the original with whatever they're being taught in the schools or law school. And here's another one. This is the Oath of Hippocrates. This is from a manuscript from the Byzantine Empire that is in the Vatican Library. And this is the version of the Oath of Hippocrates that is posted on the wall at AAPS headquarters. It might as well be written in Greek for the understanding that Americans have about what it really says. The one that was quoted to us yesterday as the Hippocratic Oath, or a Hippocratic Oath, was read aloud at my 40th medical school reunion at Columbia University, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and it was written by somebody at Columbia, Louis Lasagna. It really was the Oath of Lasagna, although it's called the Hippocratic Oath. It is by no means the worst of the Erzatz Hippocratic Oaths, and in your packets I've put copies of some of the ones that are in use, and a point-by-point -point comparison with the real original oath. So, you know, we are losing quite a lot of uh, things from our foundations, and people are going to forget about them if we do not renew their understanding. Well, how's that all going to come out? Is there really any uh, ultimate justice? This is a consensus Western view that was believed for many, millennia, and there's the judge. There's the supreme judge. This is by Michelangelo, about 1540. It's on the wall of the Sistine Chapel. How many of you think that this judge is applying the case law of the US Supreme Court? Maybe not too many of you. He's not abiding by the Federal Trade Commission rules or by any medical society rules like the AMA principles. So I don't know what will happen, but that is a, a possibility. And I'd like to end just with a little bit of philosophy, America's favorite philosophy. My sports hero, who died recently at the age of 90, Yogi Berra. If you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. Thank you very much.